Therefore, it's time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. You know, I've asked before in this uh, legislature about the aspect of the People's Guarantee that I was most excited about, the $1.9 billion investment in mental health over 10 years. Now, I know we've heard the government's talking points, their lines, their rhetoric, that what they've done is good enough, but it isn't. And I'm going to ask again, will they match our commitment for an additional that's an additional $1.9 billion into mental health to make sure we close this gap, this dirty little secret in our health care system? Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I'm happy to go through this again, yeah. because the piece, and in fact, I will give the opportunity to the leader of the opposition to correct his record and to correct his platform as well. Because when he talks about a historic, unprecedented investment in mental health, when he talks about it being the largest investment of any province in mental health in this country's history. He is absolutely and categorically wrong, and he needs to understand that his investment of $1.9 billion being proposed would Over result in a years. dramatic reduction in the level of funding and increase that this, that this, this government has actually put into place. In fact, and I know he's laughing, Mr. Speaker, but I'm happy from now through the election yeah. to remind Ontarians that we invested yeah, over $10 billion of new money over the last 10 years. He He's proposing only $1.9 billion. Uh, yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Liberal Minister Mass. of Health, and I get he's probably getting these talking points from the Premier's office, but it is incorrect. Mr. Speaker, our challenge to the government is to match the commitment we're making, which is in addition, in addition, $1.9 billion to make sure we close this gap. In 1979, we spent 11% of our health care budget on mental health. Despite all their talk, all their rhetoric, all their fake spin, today we spend 6%. It's not good enough, Mr. Speaker. And that's why I am challenging the government to match our commitment for an additional $1.9 billion towards mental health. Will they match this commitment, yes or no, of additional new funding? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, their commitment is simply not enough. In fact, I stood up in this legislature, and I know the leader of the, third, of the, of the opposition is laughing now, but I'm happy to sit down with them and go through the numbers because our increase in new funding using the precise same methodology as they do in their platform, Mr. Speaker, results in next year they're proposing to spend an additional $151 million. In our first year of the last decade, we added $600 million wow. new dollars. Oh, In their second year, they're proposing an additional $190 million. We added $650 million. In fact, if you look at their first four years of new investments in mental health, Mr. Speaker, they're proposing less than a billion dollars, considerably less than a billion in the first four years. We this contributed new investments of over three billion dollars wow. over the same period of time. Stop. 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 Sit down. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health, and it's Liberal Math at it again. They're applauding, saying that everything's fine. You know, yesterday we learned in the Globe and Mail. The, and this is from the Globe, Mr. Speaker. The majority of people treated in an Ontario emergency room after a suicide attempt are not seen by a psychiatrist within six months. Six months. I hear stories from parents and grandparents who have had a young person, a child who's reached out for help, and they have to wait six months. You know, there's children who are taking their lives who have the courage have the courage to have asked for help, and our health care system is abandoning them. And yet we've got a government saying everything is fine. It's not fine, Mr. Speaker. Will the Minister of Health match our pledge to put an additional $1.9 billion in new funding into mental health sure. on top of all the commitments they've made that have not come through? Thank you. Minister? 
Speaker, their bad math is not limited to mental health because they're committed to building 15,000 new long-term care beds, but they've only budgeted $77 million over their entire mandate to do that, Mr. Speaker. We've committed to 5,000 over the next four years. That commitment, Mr. Speaker, is going to cost the government $380 million. They're proposing to build three times as many beds, but they've funded, they've budgeted one-fifth what we budgeted for just 5000 So we're contributing $60,000 annually per bed. They're actually contributing only $5,000 annually for the operations and nothing on capital. So they have to dramatically increase their commitment to make that 15,000 beds. They have to actually raise their commitment from $77 million Answer. to almost a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. That's another billion missing in their platform. Stop the clock. As I have been doing, and you have noticed, I've been providing you with an opportunity to be your own judge and jury. It hasn't happened. We're in warnings. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. The government has currently been dodging questions about gas plants 2.0. There are almost $80 million that belong to ratepayers that are still missing. The minister knows that electricity companies built ratepayers for over $260 million through ineligible expenses. And the minister knows that there is still nearly $80 million worth of ineligible expenses that have yet to be repaid to the ratepayers and taxpayers. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is clear and direct to the Minister of Finance. Will he commit to this legislature to recoup that money on behalf of Ontario ratepayers? Minister of Finance. Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Energy. Speaker. Um, you know, we, we take market oversight of our electricity system uh, very seriously, and any instance of wrongdoing will be investigated and dealt with accordingly, Mr. Speaker. And we are confident in the Ontario Energy Board and our system operator to run an efficient, reliable, and fair electricity market for ratepayers across the province. There are strong measures in place under Ontario's electricity market rules that allow the system operator to identify and take action on false claims under these market programs, our system operator has the authority to conduct audits of claims made by generators and other market participants, and if needed, Mr. Speaker, our system operator can impose fines and seek the recovery of amounts that were incorrectly claimed. And I know, Mr. Speaker, in the past, uh, Goraway was an example. A record $10 million yes, fine was imposed, and $100 million in payments were recovered from the generator's total claims, and $168 Thank million dollars of the $200 million has been claim so far. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the minister. We know that one of those companies gaming the system was the government-run OPG. We know that they are doing this at the same time that hydro rates were skyrocketing, seniors couldn't afford their hydro bills, were being disconnected, and families were afraid, petrified, to open their hydro bills. What, how did the government respond? They ignored warning after warning after warning. And then they rewarded, this is unbelievable, Mr. Speaker, they rewarded the former CEO of OPG with a bonus of half a million dollars. A half a million dollar bonus while the system was being played like a fiddle. Taxpayers, ratepayers abused. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is who signed off on this half a million dollar bonus why OPG built the system and ratepayers had their funds question. stolen? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. OPG is Ontario's low-cost provider of electricity, and they take the responsibility to Ontarians very seriously, Mr. Speaker. OPG works every day to ensure they act in an appropriate and fully compliant manner that respects the rules that govern Ontario's electricity system, Mr. Speaker. With regard to their participation in the real-time generator cost guarantee program, OPG believed they were acting in compliance with the program's policies as set out by the system operator. 
OPG has said in a statement, they did not intentionally misuse the market rules, and OPG was not sanctioned as a result of their participation in that program. The audit did determine that there were differences in understanding of what con constituted eligible costs under the program. So, in respect of some of what those eligible costs were, OPG repaid certain claims, uh, claimed amounts after Answer. discussions concluded what were eligible costs. OPG promptly repaid all of the amount to the ISO in full in 2015. Thank you. And the matter was concluded. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, uh, you know, the response that some of the ineligible expenses have been repaid isn't good enough. You know, the front bench of the Liberal caucus has sat idly by while this has all happened. They let these companies yeah. claim expenses that were completely ridiculous. You know, you look at hear stories of expensing scuba gear and raccoon traps. Scuba gear and raccoon traps. I'm asking about expenses like that in the legislature, and they have the audacity to say everything is fine, everything is rosy. And for the life of me, and this is the reason I asked the question to the Minister of Finance, is I can't understand why four ministers of energy and two premiers have allowed this to happen. The member from Essex is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker. Four ministers of energy, two Liberal premiers, Question. have been asleep at the switch when this has happened. Will the Minister of Finance tell us how this has been allowed? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think everyone in this House would agree that abuses within the system are completely unacceptable, Mr. Speaker, and that's why our system operator has investigated those market participants and where significant wrongdoing was present, Mr. Speaker, compensation has been recovered and returned to the ratepayers. $168 million of the $200 million in ineligible costs have been recovered by the ISO, Mr. Speaker. The $32 million that is remaining, those are still in discussions. An example, Mr. Speaker, is Goreway. Goreway was caught gaming the system, Mr. Speaker. They were fined a record $10 million, Mr. Speaker, and they recovered $100 million of those costs, Mr. Speaker, and they brought those back to the ratepayers. We all agree that the abuses of the system Answer. are unacceptable. That's why we continue to ensure that we've made the changes so things like this will never happen again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I hope that's not a test. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Does the Premier of this province and the Liberal government believe that hydro bills should have partisan Liberal advertising and include partisan Liberal flyers? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Minister of Energy. Sir of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is important that all ratepayers in the province know what is on their bills, Mr. Speaker, and that's why um, Hydro One has a pilot project underway in which they're doing a new bill redesign, Mr. Speaker, helping uh, helping customers right across uh, the province that are Hydro One customers understand their bills uh, and some of the complexity of the bills, Mr. Speaker. Knowing that they're getting a 25% reduction on their bills is important, Mr. Speaker. It's the same thing like the debt retirement charge. The debt retirement charge has been eliminated for residential uh, customers, Mr. Speaker, but um, hindsight being 2020, we thought letting people know on their bills that it was no longer a cost on there, but leaving it on so people could understand that was actually the opposite, Mr. Speaker. We believe making sure that we have a clear guideline for um, all residential customers, for all ratepayers across the province, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work with yes, Hydro sir. One. We'll continue to work with all the LDCs to come up with a bill that is clear for all ratepayers right across Thank the you. province. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to know why their hydro bill now includes desperate Liberal Party campaign advertising. I'm going to send an order in council across the aisle to the Deputy Premier, who's claiming this doesn't exist. If I can get a page, please. 
What this does is it forces hydro companies to include liberal campaign messaging on people's hydro bills. Wow. And the order is personally signed by the Minister of Energy wow. and the Deputy Premier, who also happens to be the chair of the Ontario Liberal election campaign. Whoa. Can she clarify for us, Speaker? Can she clarify for us exactly which hat she was wearing when she signed that order in Council? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is this Deputy Premier, it's this government that wears the hat that protects ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. It's that party over there, Mr. Speaker, that votes against a 25% reduction for every single family in this province. How can they look in the mirror, Mr. Speaker, and stand up every day and say that they're defending the ratepayers in this province when they did absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker? Absolutely nothing. What they talk about right now is buying back Hydro One shares, Mr. Speaker. That's actually going to stop building hospitals. Stop building schools, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're doing on this side of the House. When it comes to Northern Ontario or rural customers or low-income individuals or First Nations individuals, you know what they did, Mr. Speaker? They forgot about them. They actually didn't even put them into their plan. And they can wave their finger all they want, but the truth hurts, Mr. Speaker. It's this party that protected ratepayers in this province. Hey, hey, hey. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Minister of Energy and the Chair of the Ontario Liberal Election Campaign personally signed the order for hydro utilities to include partisan messaging in Ontario's hydro bills. Who is paying for these Liberal flyers, Speaker? The people of Ontario or the Liberal Party? It's an easy answer, Mr. Speaker. It's the people of Ontario, unlike the opposition, right? The people of Ontario is the one that we actually stand up for. And Let me check my list. I'll, I'll check it twice. <laughs> I believe someone is warned. Again, Mr. Speaker, it's the people of Ontario, the 25 per cent reduction that it's this government that brought forward to help them with the relief, Mr. Speaker, because we invested $70 billion in rebuilding the system, Mr. Speaker. We made sure that we have a supply mix that can actually be relied on, Mr. Speaker. It's bringing forward clean power, and that is something that we should all be proud of in this province. But when it comes to defending the interests of the people of Ontario, it is this government. Yes, we are building up our province, and we're making sure that our electricity Electricity rates are as affordable as possible, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Deputy Premier. The Minister of Energy and the Deputy Premier Chair of Ontario's Liberal Election Campaign personally signed a government order forcing hydro utilities to mail out partisan flyers from July 2017 through to July 2018. That's a month after Election Day, Speaker. That means that partisan Liberal flyers are going to be mailed to homes across Ontario from now through to Election Day and beyond. So let's agree to call these flyers what they are, desperate Liberal campaign advertising. I don't think that's right, Speaker. New Democrats don't think that's right. Does the Deputy Premier think that's right? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess the NDP didn't think giving people in Ontario a 25 per cent reduction was right. It. They voted against it, Mr. Speaker. I guess they didn't think giving low-income individuals a break by an enhanced Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, was right, because they voted against it, Mr. Speaker. I guess they didn't think giving First Nations a delivery charge credit, Mr. Speaker, was a good thing, because they voted against that as well, Mr. Speaker. Mm. The list goes on and on. They vote against everything, Mr. Speaker. They vote against things that actually help people in this province. Mr. Speaker, they voted against making sure people that live in rural and northern parts of our province seen a 40 to 50 percent reduction. 
That is significant for those customers, Mr. Speaker, that are living in those parts of the province, making sure that they can actually see their bills lowered significantly. Because again, Mr. Speaker, Answer. some of them don't have a choice between natural gas or electricity, so they're using electricity, and we're working on that as well with the Minister of Infrastructure, rolling out a plan to get natural gas to these Thank communities you. as well, Thank Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, what isn't right is using public money for partisan purposes. That's what's not right. You know, Speaker, there isn't a single person in Ontario whose bill will be lowered because they received Liberal campaign ads in their hydro bill. No business and no family. There is zero public good that comes from this advertising campaign. In fact, local distributors are against the politicization of people's bills. Jim Ryan, chair of Niagara on the Lake Hydro, said this recently, and I quote, putting political messaging on the invoice is simply wrong. I agree. It is wrong. The only group that benefits from mailing out these partisan flyers is the Liberal Party. Is the Liberal Party paying for these flyers, Question. or is it the people and businesses of Ontario? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. So we have an LDC working group. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, with the uh, Electricity Distributor Association uh, part of that group, which represents all local utilities across the province, and they're working uh, with us, Mr. Speaker, as part of the long-term energy plan to create a bill redesign, Mr. Speaker, so they understand what needs to be done and how we need to ensure that we make it as clear as possible for people to understand how our electricity system works and how our electricity bills work as well, Mr. Speaker. So we work with the LDC. We make sure that we work with all stakeholders in this sector, low-income individuals, First Nations groups, Mr. Speaker, to bring forward a 25 percent reduction that they've been seeing on their bills now for almost six months, Mr. Speaker. And that is, Mr. Speaker, thanks to us, thanks to this government, unlike the opposition who voted Answer. against it over and over again. Final supplement. Speaker, he's got a working group of the LDCs together so that they can figure out how they're going to put the forced partisan advertising on the hydro bills in Ontario. That's what's going on, Speaker. Ontarians should not be paying for desperate partisan liberal flyers to be printed and then mailed to them in their hydro bills. It's bad enough that people have to open their bill and see the costs that's come from decades of conservative and liberal privatization in our electricity system. They shouldn't have to get Liberal Party campaign ads as well. Will this Liberal government do the right thing by the people of this province and stop this practice immediately? Thank you. You it, please. <clears throat> Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, so when people open their bills in this province, what they see is a 25 percent reduction, thanks to this government, Mr. Speaker. Member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When low-income individuals open their bill, they see further reductions on their bill thanks to the Enhanced Ontario Electricity Support Program. When First Nations open their bill when they live on a reserve, Mr. Speaker, they will see that there is no longer a delivery charge on their bill, and that's thanks to this government working with many First Nations right across the province, Mr. Speaker, and hearing and listening to their needs and acting on that, Mr. Speaker. We have made sure that Hydro One has come forward with some changes, especially with their uh, distribution charge as well, Mr. Speaker. They're going to see the triple RP um, decrease their bills between 40 and 50 percent, Mr. Answer. Speaker, and that is something that the opposition parties voted against. That is shameful, Mr. Speaker, because we listened to the people of Ontario and acted on their request, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. My question this morning is for the acting premier. <laughs> Speaker, the auditor pointed out last week that nine companies built electricity customers out of $265 million on their bills. We know that three of them are Goreway, Resolute Forest Products, and Ontario Power Generation. We know two of the anonymous companies still sit on the panel writing the government's new electricity rules after they broke the old ones. The Premier can't have it both ways, Speaker. So why is the Premier protecting companies who cheated electricity customers 
And will she stop allowing them to write the new rules for the electricity system after breaking the old ones? Thank you, Dr. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, pleased to rise and talk about the market oversight um, that is, is put in place by our electricity uh, system operator and, and the important uh, role that they play, Mr. Speaker. And again, um, I think we would all agree that any abuses of our system um, just cannot happen, Mr. Speaker. And so we are looking at uh, changing the system. We've got market renewal underway. And what we have there, Mr. Speaker, is rebuilding the foundation of our electricity system to allow for more flexibility but also to ensure that the abuses of this system stop and don't continue, Mr. Speaker. So we have a working group in place right now um, to make sure that we can find ways to ensure that we can make this system function properly. And it is important to stay, say, say, Mr. Speaker, that the two co-chairs of that working group have resigned yes, as sir. of December 1st, and they both come from the companies that were mentioned by the uh, member from the opposition. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker. This is an absolute snow job by the government again, and we need to get to the bottom of this. Even the electricity system operator, the IESO, is tired of covering for the government. The ISO told the Canadian press yesterday that the government is allowed to change the rules and disclose the names of the other six companies who cheated electricity customers on their bills. So now we're back to the greatest hits of the Liberals in question period. Who are they protecting? And what are they hiding? Speaker, will the acting premier commit to the people of Ontario that will have the names of those anonymous companies by the end of business today? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Again, um, the ISO right now is continuing discussions with those companies, working on getting back $32 million of costs that were ineligible, Mr. Speaker. And as OPG come out and said publicly that they were, yes, one of those companies, they actually resolved that quite quickly back in 2015. Through that process, Mr. Speaker, OPG thought they were applying for program costs that they were eligible for. After discussion with the system operator, they recognized that they weren't eligible for these costs. And so they uh, acted quickly, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they could repay those costs. They did that very quickly back in 2015. There was no fines levied because it was an error, and they recognized that error, and they fixed that mistake, Mr. Speaker. The costs were recovered, and they made sure, Mr. Speaker, that it was concluded in a, excuse me, in a timely fashion, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Week after week, we're hearing more heartbreaking stories of overcrowding inside Ontario's hospitals and the suffering that families are going through. South Lake Regional Health Centre in Newmarket is operating at 125 percent capacity. Patients are being put in hallways, auditoriums, lounges, and even gymnasiums because there aren't enough fund funded beds. Executives at South Lake are speaking out now and calling it an overcrowding crisis. But the Premier has only given South Lake four temporary beds. Why is this government doing so little to help patients who are being treated today in hallways, auditoriums, and gymnasiums in hospitals across this province? Thank you, Dr. Kinder. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, you'll recall that uh, a number of weeks ago, uh, this government made the announcement that we are creating 1,200 new acute care beds across this province, and in addition to that, uh, roughly 600 for transitional care. And I'm very pleased to announce and very proud, in fact, that we have now opened, as of Sunday, the reactivation care centre that was formerly at the Finch site of Humber River Hospital. And I want to congratulate all of the hospitals and their staff that made an absolutely perfect and seamless transition, including I want to acknowledge the CEO of South Lake Regional Hospi Health Centre, Mr. Speaker, because they transported 30 of their inpatients into this reactivation centre at the Finch site, wow. Mr. Speaker, and that is just one of five hospitals where they now have 125 additional beds opening, and as you can yes, imagine, sir. reducing by between 6 to 8 percent the complement of people in beds, including at South Lake. So, in fact, this Fantastic. is very important yeah. for that hospital. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, South, L South Lake has 100 more patients than they have funding to care for, but the Premier is only allocating four beds, four temporary beds. That means patients are stuck in hallways. Patients don't have bathrooms. They have to share 
public washrooms down the hallways from their rooms. People don't have privacy, and the hospital isn't able to use the right kind of infection control measures. People are suffering from the crisis of hospital overcrowding in the GTA and across Ontario. Why isn't this government doing more to stop the crisis that the Liberal and Conservative hospital cuts have created over these last couple of years? So, Mr. Speaker, we're opening and in most cases have opened the equivalent of six community hospitals across this province. And that includes so the hospitals that are involved in the Humber site include Mackenzie Health, South Lake, North York General Hospital. Hospital and the Humber Wilson site as well. Each of those hospitals is moving 30 of their existing inpatients into that better transitional rehabilitative and reactivation care. But in fact, Mr. Speaker, in the in early 2018, Markham Stouffville will transfer an additional 24, and Mackenzie is going to send over another 90, Mr. Speaker. It will result in a 17% reduction in the inpatient load at Mackenzie, and not to be beaten by uh, that specific announcement. Hillcrest Reactivation Centre through University Health Network in St. Elizabeth just opened this past weekend as well an additional 75 beds for wow. transitional yes, rehabilitation care. This is a fantastic uh, pro uh, progress, and I congratulate all of Thank those you. involved. Excellent. New question, member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Housing, Minister responsible for poverty reduction strategy. We know that even though Ontario's economy is strong, some people are still struggling to get by. Poverty is a problem that needs to be er eradicated so every everyone has the opportunity to achieve his or her full potential and contribute to a prosperous and healthy Ontario. One way we are do working towards this goal is through the local poverty reduction fund. I know that it is a six-year, $50 million commitment by this government to help eradicate poverty in our communities, and in, in, that includes my riding of Trinity Spadina, and it's working. The minister was in Thunder Bay yet, just yesterday to make a further announcement on local poverty reduction fund. Could the minister tell us more about this announcement? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Minister of Housing, Minister responsible for the re reduction of poverty strategy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister, uh, member from Trinity Spadina for the question. In Ontario, we have an incredibly strong economy right now, Mr. Speaker, but unfortunately, poverty remains a reality for far too many Ontarians. On this side of the House, we're committed to creating fairness and op opportunity for all Ontarians. And earlier this fall, I announced Ontario's uh, commitment to the poverty reduction strategy with $16 million for 48 projects in communities right across Ontario. But yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was in Thunder Bay to announce the Indigenous stream of local poverty reduction fund initiatives uh, created in partnership with Indigenous communities and First Nations. Mr. Speaker, these programs are going to assist those communities in tailoring programs that are specific to their needs that will assist Indigenous and First Nations people uh, with food security, with their housing, with income supports and employment supports. Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the minister for that answer. In fact, recently I was able to announce several projects in and around my riding that are funded through the local Re poverty reduction fund. This includes funding to the Access Capital Community Fund, which will use the funding to help train newcomers, visible minority, women, youth, and others in entrepreneurship and other skills development. Great. This funding will help so many people the, uh, by giving them the opportunity to thrive in Ontario. I'm glad to hear the local poverty reduction fund is helping Indigenous community in specific. Could the minister tell us more about our government's effort to alleviate poverty in Indigenous community and support healthy, prosperous community? Thank you, Speaker. Good question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, our government knows that poverty looks very different depending on what part of the province you're in, and the needs of Northern Ontario First Nations can in fact be quite different than those in Southern Ontario. Speaker, that's why we are investing $5 million in 14 Indigenous-led housing projects that were announced yesterday by the Minister of Housing. Through innovative programs like this, as well as our $95 million in Indigenous Economic Development Fund and a further $56 million investment in Indigenous institutes, we are creating fairness and opportunity for Indigenous communities. 
Our government knows that reconciliation requires action in addition to words, and that's why we are working with Indigenous communities to ensure a better future for Indigenous Answer. peoples in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. The Financial Accountability Office uh, showed us Ontario is working with three sets of books, Speaker. Wow. That is simply ridiculous. We need one set of books, one true set of numbers to guide us. There's a way to do this, and that's for the government to follow the law, pass a regulation, and release their pre-election finance report. They promised. The Auditor General said, quote, it's in the public's interest for the government to give us a pre-election report to examine as soon as possible with sufficient time to do our work. This will give us one number, one set of books. Speaker, will the government tell us when they will be bringing the regulation forward and when they will present the Question. auditor with their pre-election finance report? Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The reason there is a pre-election report is because this government mandated it because of the of the elimination and the fact that they held and hid a deficit throughout their proposal when they were coming into a budget. We are balancing the books, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the FAO for uh, the work they're doing around the sensitivity. He acknowledges that our economy is growing, that we have taken steps to balance the budget. In fact, the public accounts, which is the one that matters most, is what has happened to this state, illustrate that we beat again our targets last year by over $3 billion, under 0.1 billion in terms of our actual results. So I acknowledge the work that's being done by the FAO, and I recognize that the member opposite, with his own promises, are not able to keep it because his own uh, analysis states that they are not going to be able to achieve it. And I'll Answer. say more in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Families need to be able to trust what the government says about our finances. They deserve a true fiscal picture. That's only fair. But the Auditor General has refused to sign off on Ontario's books multiple times under this Liberal government. The Auditor has one more opportunity, and that's to review a pre-election finance report. First, the government must pass a regulation confirming it will release a pre-election report by a committed deadline. We want one set of books so we can truly assess the damage the Liberals have done to Ontario. Speaker, I'll ask again. Will the government tell us when they will be bringing the regulation forward and when they will present the Question. auditor with their pre-election sure. finance report? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we are using the accounting principles that have been provided over the last 16 years. In fact, an independent review of the government's pension accounting and other things that was commissioned illustrated by an expert panel concluding that the province's accounting treatments are correct. I'll leave those disputes to the accountants, but I'll say this, Mr. Speaker. Kevin Page, the individual that assessed the people's guarantee, says the following. Assessing the reasonableness of the estimates of the fiscal plan underlying the 2018 election platform of the Progressive Conservative Party, he says this, we caution readers that the provisions of an opinion on the reasonableness of the estimates underlying the fiscal plan includes reliance on third parties for information. He says, they, we, not, we do not currently or we're not currently in a position to pronounce on those expectations. Oh. We look forward to seeing more detailed plans of the future. Yes, Their numbers are based on ours, Mr. Speaker, and they are estimating Thank a deficit you. with what we're saying is Thank you. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Zara Anucha, Amanda Zulman, and Michelle Sparling are here today. They are incredibly brave advocates for children's mental health services. Zara and Amanda needed mental health supports, but like 12,000 children in Ontario, they were told that they would have to wait for the care that they desperately needed or their parents would have to pay for it out of pocket. It's just not right that any child should have to 
wait months on end for mental health supports that they need. Will the acting premier commit to eliminating the wait list for children's mental health services so that every child gets the help they need right away? Thank you, Deputy Premier. So children youth services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government is working to truly build a mental health system here in the province of Ontario uh, for young people that aims to reduce wait times and offer more services to those who need it. As a government, Mr. Speaker, we've increased our mental health spending every single year since we've been in government. We've invested over $10 billion more into the system since 2008. And, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue with that trend. Our party and the Minister of Health has publicly committed in this House on a number of occasions that we will put forward more than $1.9 billion over the next 10 years. We're working with experts right across the system, right across the province, to ensure that we're putting the investments in the right place so we can reduce wait times for young people. In, child, in the Ministry of Children, and, and in our ministry and within the sector, yes, the reality is that the complexities that young people are going through today, Mr. Speaker, are different from where they were 10 years ago, and we're building a system to take on those challenges. Supplementary. Speaker, community-based mental health centres have received only two small increases to their base funding in the past 25 years. And here's what that means for families. Moms like Michelle have had to drive long distances to get the vital treatment their kids need. Every year, 50,000 children and youth end up in crisis inside our overcrowded hospitals because they have no other place to go. As we learned just yesterday, the majority of people who are treated in an emergency room after a suicide attempt are not getting follow-up appointments with needed psychiatrists. When will this government take real action to improve mental health care and actually eliminate wait lists for children and youth across Ontario? Seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, back in 2011-2012, uh, our government committed to a new process uh, called Moving on Mental Health. It was to build a new strategy here in the province of Ontario that was backed up with a $100 million investment into children's mental health in the province of Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, that strategy commitment was to look at the way we fund, um, we fund youth mental health here in the province of Ontario so we could actually reduce wait times. We know that this is, uh, this is a, a challenge that continues to change. But, Mr. Speaker, here are some of the investments we've actually made over the last few years into youth mental health. In partnership with my ministry and the Ministry of uh, Health, we've built nine new youth wellness hubs for young people aged 12 to 25. We spend $3 million annually to support training professional development for Indigenous mental health and addiction workers, $2.75 million uh, for psychiatric hospitals, $16 million to create 1,000 more supportive housing spaces, nearly $48 million for specialized mental health services at St. Joseph Care Group in Thunder Bay. And the list goes on and on and on. Ms. Thank you. New question, the member from Etobicoke North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, the Honourable Eric Hoskins. Speaker, one of our mandates and indeed animating beliefs is that our government believes that everyone in the province of Ontario deserves high-quality health care that is dignified and compassionate, and that in particular, Speaker, includes those individuals fighting substance use disorders. We've, of course, been clear throughout the past year that we've been dealing with this as a crisis, an opioid crisis that unfortunately has taken the lives of far too many people. To address this, our government has put in place the most comprehensive opioid strategy in the country. And as we've been making critical investments to strengthen our strategy and supporting those saving lives on the front lines. But still, Speaker, last week we received tragic news from the Chief Coroner of Ontario that opioid-related deaths are continuing to rise in Ontario. Question. Speaker, my question is this. I asked the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care if he can inform this House what are the critical steps our government is taking to address this growing Thank you. public health emergency. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as Minister of Health and as a public health physician and as a father and husband, uh, not a day goes by that I do not reflect on the heartbreaking reality of this crisis, and those numbers are unfortunately going up, Mr. Speaker. 
Last week, in response to a recent federal policy change, I wrote a letter to the federal health minister declaring this crisis a public health emergency and formally requesting that they expand our ability to respond to the growing crisis by allowing us to approve and fund overdose prevention sites. Mr. Speaker, we were granted this exemption immediately, and we can now further strengthen Ontario's current harm reduction efforts in communities and protect the courageous frontline workers at these sites from federal prosecution. Mr. Speaker, we have also ramped up access to addiction treatment across the province, including in over 30 communities Answer. that will now be able to access effective rapid access addiction medicine clinics. Mr. Speaker, these are some of the life-saving supports that we're providing. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank, of course, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care for that uh, answer. Speaker, as a uh, physician and parliamentarian, of course, I'm pleased to be part of a government that has taken such strong action to ending the opioid crisis. And all health care partners have to balance the dictate between pain control and addiction avoidance, appropriate prescribing versus street recreational use, timely access to care versus harm reduction on an acute on-site basis. Our government's investments in harm reduction and addiction treatment are pillars, of course, Speaker, of our overall opioid strategy. And we know that even more support is required for those on the front lines. So I'd like to know what our government is doing to help our first responders in this shared fight. And I ask, could you develop about what the government is doing about this crisis? Uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Go north for the questions. Last week's opioid overdoses numbers from the chief coroners reinforces the critical need for urgent action to address this crisis. People suffering from addiction are often more likely to have contact with frontline responders. It is vital that we make sure our police officers and firefighters have the tools they need to respond when they find someone in crisis. When someone is overdosing, minutes can make the difference between life and death. That's why our government is making life-saving naloxone available for free to each and every police and fire services across the province. And Mr. Speaker, our firefighters and our first responders Answer. are essential partners in fighting the opioid crisis, and we will continue working together to ensure that we continue safety in our communities. Thank you. New question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Ontario's community college students lost an historic five weeks. Five weeks of class time due to the strike, which the Liberal government could have resolved earlier, but chose not to. The impact has been devastating, Speaker, for Ontario students. Many students have made the very difficult decision to drop out of their community colleges. Speaker, will the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development confirm today that approximately 25,000 students wow. have dropped out wow. due to the Liberal government's inaction wow. to the strike. Thank you. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, thank you, Speaker. And um, I, we will be confirming numbers very shortly. Uh, we are collecting data from colleges to understand what that withdrawal rate was. We thought it. It really doesn't matter where you sit, I can hear you. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Uh, speaker, we thought it was important to give students the choice, given the strike, that they could either stay in and get caught up and complete their semester. I'm happy to tell you that the vast majority of students have chosen to do that. However, for those who felt— All right, we want to play. I win. The member from Niagara South Clanbrook is warned. I did think it was fair to students to give them the choice to make the decision that was right for them. Uh, and if they chose to withdraw uh, two weeks, within two weeks after the strike, yes, speaker, uh, their, their tuition would be fully refunded. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Minister of Advanced Education. Speaker, Ontario's community colleges have done everything they can do to encourage students to remain in school. But the Liberal government, as it did for five weeks, Five weeks, Speaker, during the strike, continues to sit on his hands. For five weeks, the Premier let the strike drag on, and now the Liberal government is delaying the release 
of the number of community college students who dropped out because the information damages them politically. Ontarians have the right speaker to know the consequences of the Premier's lack of leadership on the community college strike. Will the minister stop playing politics and confirm today that approximately 25,000 dropped out from the Ontario's college, community colleges due to the Liberal government's inaction? Thank you. Speaker, uh, I, I have committed to releasing those numbers as soon as they, uh, they are available. Speaker, I uh, reiterate that commitment today. What I can tell you is the vast majority of students have stayed. There will be a, a significant number of those who withdrew with tuition refund and without academic penalty who will be re-enrolling in uh, January or perhaps September, depending on the program. But if the member opposite is suggesting that we throw collective bargaining out the window, that we just legislate back, Speaker, he clearly needs to understand that by law, we simply aren't allowed to do that, Speaker. We must let the co collective bargaining process work. We wanted to let that happen. There's no question that the, the people who were most impacted by the strike were the students. Answer. We've Doris. talked about that all the time, Speaker, and we've given them choices. Thank you. New question, the member from Tomiskamee Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Last Friday morning, December 8th, there was a tragic collision on uh, Highway 11. Uh, two transports collided on uh, the Pan Lake corner, and our thoughts go out to the families of the deceased. And what makes this even more tragic is on November 24th of last year, on exactly the same corner, another person in a transport lost their life. What makes this even more tragic is on December 12th, 2012, again, in the same place, another life was lost. And each time the highway is closed, people in Northern Ontario are cut off because there is no detour, people on the Trans-Canada are starting to be very afraid to drive. When will the minister step in and ensure that winter maintenance sta standards in highway construction is actually Thank you. done correctly in this record. To the Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member from Tomiskaming and Cochrane for the question. He and I have had a chance to speak about this informally here in the chamber over the last couple of days. I have explained to him uh, that, uh, that I, I will ask the ministry, in fact, I have asked the ministry to go and take a look specifically at this particular section of Highway 11 that, as he points out in his question, has had some challenges over the last couple of years. So that's work that we will undertake, and I'd be happy to inform him and or the House uh, once, uh, once I have that update for him. I will say over the last couple of years, the Speaker, as it relates specifically to the winter maintenance program that the ministry runs, we have continued to invest significantly in terms of the resources that are needed both in the north for our northern highways and also in the south. Speaker, we have more pieces of equipment out on our roads and highways, including in northern Ontario, uh, than we have had uh, certainly uh, certainly prior to the last three years. Answer. We, we are constantly working with our communities and working with our contractor partners to make sure that we have the appropriate resources to deploy it, and I'll have more to say Thank in you. the follow-up answer to this question. Thanks very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And since uh, my discussion with the Minister, I've also had some time to do some research. And according to the most recent statistics provided by the government in the 2014 Ontario Road Safety Annual Report, the occupants of a vehicle registered in the District of Tamisming are four times more likely to die in a collision than occupants of vehicles registered anywhere else in Ontario. And that's because they have to drive on that road. And that's why the government has to step in and look. The, the towns, the people, that road is starting to be seen as a death trap. And I don't say that lightly. This is just one example. We have step in and actually do the right thing. We don't have subways. We don't have passenger trains. We don't have LRTs. We have one road, and it needs to be safe, Minister, now. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member from Tomiskaming Cochrane for his follow-up question. And I certainly respect not only his advocacy but for his, his passion 
uh, which is obviously uh, clear in, in the way that he's asked the question today. I will say, as I said in my opening answer, our government continues to invent, invest in our winter maintenance program, including in Northern Ontario. Uh, it seems uh, so, notwithstanding what the member from Kitchener just said from the NDP caucus. In fact, the auditor did recognize last year that we have made substantial improvements in the program, both in Kitchener and in the north of the province. Speaker, having said that, I understand that our work is not yet done. The member's question ties in both highway construction and investments in the infrastructure and also the winter maintenance program. I've already referenced what we're doing in winter maintenance. I will also say, Speaker, as I believe all members know, over the last number of years, certainly in the last couple in particular, the amount of money that we are investing as a government yes, in our northern highways program is unprecedented, Speaker, but we know that we have to continue to do more. And in subsequent years, through budgets presented by the Minister of Finance, I have no doubt Thank that you. we'll continue to invest in this and in other highways to make Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, last Thursday, your ministry announced the details to some very important enhancements to the Ontario Autism Program, or OAP. I know our government has taken great care to consult with families in creating the OAP. I also know that in my riding of Davenport, I have spoken with many families and passed their feedback and concerns on to the minister. My constituents have expressed a need for choice and consistency in the program. Many families have also expressed the need for a direct funding option. I know there has been much work to provide families with the clear choice they have been asking for, the choice between direct funding and direct service. Minister, can you please share with this House the details of the new direct funding option? And thank you, Minister Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Davenport for her question. Uh, she's a, a strong advocate for families and for children uh, here in the province of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to travel across the province and meet with families and meet with parents and talk to them uh, about the autism program here in the province of Ontario. And I just want to take a moment to thank them uh, for their feedback. Uh, the member's right. Um, we heard a very clear message from families uh, when having those discussions. And uh, to respond to those families, um, we as a government are introducing a direct funding options to families. So beginning January 15th of next year, so in weeks from now, we will increase the maximum hourly rate for service purchased through the OAP from $39 an hour to a maximum of up to $55 an hour. We will communicate new qualifications for clinical supervisors that will be phased in. We'll also create yes, an OAP provider list that will help families select a qualified OAP service provider in the spring, and I have more in the supplemental, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for listening to families. I hope that all members of this House are supportive of parents' call for choice in the system and their ask for a direct funding option. There is no doubt that system transformation is a difficult undertaking, and it can create a lot of confusion for families. I've also heard from parents in my riding that when it comes to accessing autism services, the system can be very difficult to navigate. In the new Ontario Autism Program, how is your ministry going to ensure that parents are aware of the resources available to their families and are able to easily navigate the system? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So there are a number of changes that are coming to the program. I want all families to experience a smooth and seamless transition into the new Ontario Autism Program. The new OAP has a single point of access in each of the nine service areas. This will make it easier for families to access services. Contact numbers are available on my ministry website. I'm also hosting, Mr. Speaker, two teletown halls, one on January 11th at 7 p.m. and again on January 17th at 7 p.m. Parents can ask questions and get direct answers from myself and ministry staff. Details of the teletown halls and the regional provider's information are on the website, ontario.ca forward slash autism. I hope that all members in this House uh, are proud of this program and they share this information with their constituents. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Thank you. The member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. 
According to Community Living Ontario, there will be a 25 per cent reduction in the number of hours for supports for families with disabilities as a result of the government's changes to labour laws. Community Living Ontario said, and I quote, Ministry representatives have told our members not to expect any base budget increases, so that means the people that stand to lose the most are people who have an intellectual or developmental disability, families, community agencies, and their support workers. I've spoken to many families struggling to find the services they need for their loved ones. Not one of them has said they can absorb a 25% reduction in service. With a 25% cut looming and no help offered from you, does the government expect families to fund this 25% wage gap themselves? Question. Thank you. Community and Social Services. Mr. Community Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, our ministry is committed to ensuring that frontline services are available to those with developmental disabilities. And uh, we are aware of some of the impacts of uh, recent changes to our legislation in terms of Bill 148 that are impacting those particular agencies. We certainly heard from them. My ministry is very aware. Uh, we're looking at uh, the figures that they have produced for us. Uh, we're looking at them very carefully, and uh, I would assure the member that uh, uh, we will not see any diminution of any services for those adults with developmental disabilities. I'm pleased that you are aware, but the reality is okay. ministry representatives have told Community Living to, quote, not expect any base budget increases. Families who rely on special services at home and direct funding know that the government's changes will limit their ability to give the loved ones the care they deserve. Brampton Caledon Community Living President Kathy Bell said, quote, BCCL will be forced to make deep cuts to its services and labour force. This will have a severe daily living so consequences for extremely vulnerable people and their families. In a letter sent to the Premier, Brampton Caledon Community Living identified the annual cost to comply with the changes at $2.4 million. Wow. How does the government expect community living organizations and families to fund this 25% wage gap? Wow, that's just one. Thank you. Minister of Labor. Sir of Labor. Speaker, thank you, and uh, certainly I do thank the uh, member for the question. Prior to the introduction of Bill 148, Speaker. And again, the member thinks he can go to a different seat. I'll catch him. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Minister. Thank you. Prior to the, uh, the introduction of Bill 148, Speaker, we consulted broadly with the business community, with the nonprofit sector, with those people that provide services, and even after, Speaker, after the debate. These carry over into the afternoon, by the way. Speaker, what became clear was the dedicated men and women that look after the most vulnerable in our society, Speaker, sometimes needed to have their pay increased, sometimes needed some better employment standards, Speaker. These are the people that look after the most vulnerable, Speaker. What we said is that we would increase the minimum wage in the province to $14 an hour Answer. and then to $15 an hour. It would, we, it would apply to them as well, Speaker. The opposition party voted against this, Speaker. They don't stand behind the people that look after our most Thank vulnerable. You. Should be ashamed of themselves, Speaker. Before I turn to that, I would just like to let people know there is never, never, not an opportunity for me to continue to warn, even when we're at the end of question period. Point of order, the Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to correct my, ref, uh, my record, Mr. Speaker, in reference to a question from the uh, member from uh, Prince Edward uh, Hastings uh, in reference to the $32 million I used. Uh, these are disputed costs between the ISO and the companies, and the ISO's rules uh, have changed. To Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 174, an act to enact the Cannabis Act 2017 and the Ontario Cannabis Retail Corporation Act 2017 and the Smoke Free Ontario Act 2017 to repeal two acts and to make amendments to the Highway Traffic Act respecting alcohol, drugs and other matters. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? On December the 11, 2017, Mr. Nack, we moved third reading of Bill 174, an act to enact Cannabis Act 2017 and the Ontario Cannabis Retail Corporation Act 2017 and the Smoke Free Ontario Act 2017 and to repeal two acts and to make amendments to the Highway Traffic Act respecting alcohol, drugs and other matters. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack, Mr. Nack, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Su Mr. Mr. Souza, Mr. Souza, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Dugan, Mr. Dugan, Mr. Dugan, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Leo, Mr. Leo, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Tebow, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Mr. Codry, Mr. Codry, Mrs. Manga, Mrs. Manga, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Ms. Domlin, Ms. Domlin, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mr. Mora, Mr. Mora, Ms. Jassy, Ms. Jassy, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Mr. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Renio. Ms. Renio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Shibby Song. Ms. Shibby Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise. One time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 63, the nays are 27. The ayes being 63 and the nays being 27, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 160, an act to amend, repeal, and enact various acts in the interest of strengthening quality and accountability of patients. Call in the members, this will be a five minute bill. On December 7, 2017, Mr. Ballard moved third reading of Bill 160, an act to amend, repeal, and enact various acts in the interest of strengthening quality and accountability for patients. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. 
Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mrs. Domerlo. Mrs. Domerlo. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mrs. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mrs. Hogar. Mrs. Hogar. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mrs. Rinio. Mrs. Rinio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise. One and five, be recognized by the. Mr. Yer, Mr. Yer, Mr. Arnott, Mr. Arnott, Mr. Arnott, Mr. Hardeman, Mr. McLeod, Mr. McLeod, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Yakubus, Mr. Yakubus, Mr. Hillier, Mr. Hillier, Mr. Miller, Perry, Samuskoka, Mr. Miller, Perry, Samuskoka, Mr. McNaught, Mr. McNaught, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Romano, Mr. Romano, Mr. Ostrow, Mr. Ostrow, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, Mrs. Marteau, Mrs. Marteau, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. McDonnell, Mr. McDonnell, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cho, Mr. Cho, Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Monsieur uh, Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The eyes are 49, the nays are 42. The eyes being 49 and the nays being 42, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion of closure of the third reading of Bill 139. Call on the members, this will be a five minute bill. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 49, the nays are 42. The ayes being 49 and the nays being 32, I declare the motion carried. Okay. That's it. There are, oh, Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow has moved third reading of Bill 139, an act to enact the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal Act 2017 and the Local Planning Appeal Support Centre Act 2017, and to amend the Planning Act and the Conservation Authorities Act with various other acts. Is the pleasure of the House motion carry? No. I heard a no. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute five bill. Move third reading of Bill 139, an act to enact a local planning appeal tribunal act 2017 and the local planning appeal support center act 2017 and to amend the planning act, the conservation authorities act, and various other acts. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be Ms. Darmelin. Ms. Darmelin. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms.
Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashek. Mr. Natashek. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. <coughs> Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 87, the nays are 1. The ayes being 87, the nays being 1, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. We have resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.